after a uh, a long absence because I was moving moving jobs, moving uh, moving states, all kinds of different things. Moving, um, but I am back, continuing to talk about the 2019 college football. Like talking about college football, it's it's pretty much my favorite thing. Um, so this is my form that I don't expect anybody to ever actually see, but it makes me feel good to know that I've put something out there in the world, my thoughts. So um, I'm going division by division, counting down um, how I think the teams will finish. Um, this time I'm gonna talk Pac-12 North. Um, these videos are 10 minutes or so long each. So it's not too much out of your time if you happen to find me. Um, <clears throat> All right, so the Pac-12, um, I'm gonna start by saying this is by far the best division in the Pac-12, way better than the South. I think five of the top six teams in the Pac-12 actually come from the Pac-12 North. Um, so uh, here we go. Counting down number six, definitely not one of the uh, six best teams in the Pac-12. It's probably the 12th best team in the Pac-12, but it's the Oregon State Beavers. They're just plain bad. Um, they're in a bad division to be starting sort of from scratch. So um, if they win one conference game, maybe two, that will be a success this year. They're, they're two to three years away from contending for Bulls. So I fully expect um, them to end up being two and 10, three, nine. I hardly know anything about them. The coach um, in his second year now, he knows about the Oregon State program. He played there, so it makes sense. He knows what it takes to succeed there. And 2019, way too many hurdles to overcome. So um, I'm done talking about Oregon State. At number five, this is one that I think people might find fun. Number five, I have the Stanford Cardinal. Um, this is the lowest I think anybody's had them probably since Jim Harbaugh uh, was in his first, second year at the team, but this speaks to one, the improvement of the division, and two, the fact that I just see them sliding bit by bit by bit, year after year, especially since Kevin Hogan um, left the team. Um, they haven't had an answer at quarterback. They've switched quarterbacks consistently. Um, Keller Christ wasn't the answer. Ryan Burns wasn't the answer. You know, all kinds of players were not the answer. Now it's KJ Costello. Is he actually the answer? Are they going to switch him again midseason like they have been the past few seasons? They don't have Bryce Love to rely on anymore. The offensive line isn't as good as they have been. There's a couple guys. Walker Little is a stud. Those recruits haven't proven themselves quite yet besides Little. Um, Costello doesn't have JJ or Sega Whiteside to throw to anymore. I don't see this offense exploding or improving this year. And I don't see the defense being a typical Stanford defense. Paul Snadebo is, is probably the only player on this defense that would have been a standout player five years ago. I just think they're slipping and slipping and slipping and slipping. Um, seven and five ish type of team. They're still one of the better teams in the Pac 12, but the competition is now a lot more fierce than it has been at the top. I have questions as to whether David Shaw can get them back to where they were or whether they're going to be stuck in sort of a seven and five perpetuity. Um, moving on from Stanford, number four, I've got the Cal Bears. This defense is phenomenal. Justin Wilcox is a great defensive coach. This team mirrors what those Stanford teams of about 2010, 2011, 2012 were. And defense, let's see if they have enough offense to come through. I think they do. I think they're a surprise team, an eight and four type team, fringe top 25. Justin Wilcox is doing a heck of a job. They just need some semblance of an offense to really contend. And I think they'll end up being a surprise team. Evan Weaver, um, on that defense for Cal is an all American candidate. He's a monster. Um, the rest of the team's building around that defensive identity of things. Um, I think his system's being put into place. If he has the right players to work that system, 
yeah, I think this is a surprise team that could go eight and four, something like that. They play Ole Miss early in the season. Ole Miss is not an excellent team by any means, but it's a win that people might notice. Um, so I think Cal is back on the map this year. I have them at fourth. I thought about putting them at number three, but I'm going to keep with Washington State at number three. Um, Mike Leach reaches a point five, six years into a tang year at a school where it's just cruising altitude, eight and four, nine and three, eight and four, nine and three, eight and four, nine and three. Maybe you can peak up like last year to 10 and two if you have Gardner Minshew or some other great quarterback, Graham Harrell back at Texas Tech. But once he hits that point, you don't see a dip from a Mike Leach team. That's just how it works. So I expect eight and four, nine and three, eight and four, nine and three, with maybe a 10 and two season, maybe a struggle season with a bunch of injuries gets them to seven and five. But um, the supporting cast right now around whoever the quarterback might be, um, I think Gabe, Gabe Gubnell, Grubnell might be his name. Another transfer this time from Eastern Washington, apparently a Pac-12 pipeline. Um, give me Washington State to go eight and four, nine and three again, you know, be right at that Alamo Bowl level team, um, about 20th in the country, something like that. Um, that's what I expect out of Washington State from here on out. So that's what I'm going to put them. Um, now, Muskies, they lose so many players that were part of that this run of the playoff and the Rose Bowl and the Fiesta Bowl. Jake Browning's gone. Miles Gaskin is gone. Taylor Rapp is gone. Ben Burkirvan is much of a step, but you can't help but expect a little bit of a slip. They're recruiting at a better level than they were five years ago. Jacob Beeson comes in. I would expect him to win the job. You know, former former number one quarterback recruit in the country. Um, Salvan Ahmed, the running back, obviously showed a ton as Gaskin's backup. Um but I'm very curious to see what happens with the defense. I don't expect a huge drop off, like I said, but because of the toughness in this division, I have a hard time seeing them coming out on top. I wouldn't be shocked. I'd be a little bit surprised. That would tell me that Washington has truly established itself as the program in the Pac-12 North and and the Pac-12. In fact, if they win this difficult division in what should be a transition year for them. I still expect about a top 15 result, but maybe not that top five, six, seven, like they've been the past three years. And that leads me to my top team in the Pac-12 North, the Oregon Ducks. Quack. Um, Mario Cristobal is revamping this team in a way that's still Oregon, but his Oregon. That means tough offensive line. This is probably the best offensive line in the Pac-12. Um, Panay Sewell is a monster up there. Um, Dallas Warmack is still there somehow. Chance Warmack's younger brother. This offensive line is going to be tough, which is what Mario Cristobal wants. He's an offensive lineman at heart. That's what he was. That's what he coached, um, which means tough physical running, but still kind of looking like Oregon with the shotgun spread, um, new uniforms, things like that. So it's Mario Cristobal's Oregon. It's not necessarily Chip Kelly's Oregon anymore. Um, there's still aspects of that Oregon, though. Justin Herbert um, could be the best quarterback in the country. I think I put him number one on my power rankings for uh, best quarterbacks in the country. Uh, the defense is continuing to improve. Troy Dye is still there. They got the number one recruit, Kayvon Thibodeau, coming in on defensive line. Um, the reason I put Oregon slightly ahead of Washington is because Oregon brings back this experience. There's more continuity there. Chris Ball in his second year has a better sense of what's going on. They've recruited like gangbusters. Um, I know they, I believe they go to Washington to jump them up top six, seven, eight in the polls this year or after week one. Um, can they, can they maintain that high that I think that they can get to? I think that they can, um, as long as Herbert stays healthy, which has been a little bit of an issue for him. 
I could see this team very much contending. Um, the fun thing about Pac-12 North, though, is that five of these teams could legitimately beat each other in any given week. So while Oregon might come out on top, and that's my prediction for what's going to happen, I don't know how many losses they might pick up along the way because of the toughness of this division. Um, if you get Utah in a cross-divisional game, that's one more really tough game. I don't expect a ton out of USC this year, but they've got the talent to pull upsets. Um, if Kevin Sumlin gets it together a little bit, it could really beat each other up. And I think beat each other up at a high level, um, not at this low level like they kind of have been the past year too, where you can kind of forget about them. It's going to be exciting. And it's gonna, I'm going to pick Oregon to win that game as long as they're healthy. Utah has the easier schedule, so they might come in more on a roll. But I'm going to take Oregon to win the Pac-12 overall, as well as the uh, as well as the Pac-12 North. Um, and that's um, and that's where I stand on the Pac-12. Um, I'm going to move on to the ACC next. Uh, thank you for stumbling upon me. Um, this is this is not in-depth analysis. This is not groundbreaking stuff. This is just somebody who likes college football wanting to say something because, um, you know, it's fun to get your thoughts out there. Anyways, thank you for uh, stumbling upon me, and uh, I'll talk to you later.